Matt and Joanne, right? Lined up for us right here. Hey, there they are. Wonderful. We we go way back with Matt and Joanne through through the birding world, through the Golden Gate Audubon Society. Their backyard garden features a community of plants native to the western San Francisco Peninsula. They have a nature trail that winds through low, medium profile dune scrub habitat, connecting two permeable brick patios with several bird baths. They've had over 40 species of birds attracted to the garden. Take it away, Matt and Joanne. Hi, everyone. Welcome Hello. to our backyard. Um, prior to what it looks like now in the transformation, um, the perimeter of this in about 2001 was overgrown with ivy and exotics, and the center of it was dominated by a concrete patio. So we decided to break up that concrete patio right in the middle of the yard and to start our garden. We were pleasantly surprised to find some native dune um, sand under there, and that's where we started it. So as Eddie mentioned, thank you for the intro, Eddie. Um, we've got two permeable brick patios and four bird baths throughout and a rock pile in the back. Let's go take a look. Okay, we'll switch around here. There we go. Okay, so we'll give you, start with an overview of the garden. Uh, you can see it's about, tw it's, it is 25 feet wide, about 60 feet deep. And uh, we now have it covered in, entirely in natives. Uh, in the foreground, you can see the permeable uh, brick patio. It's made from uh, salvage brick. And it, the rainwater goes right through. So let's see, the first plant we want to show you is do not weed. And you can see it's low growing, forms a nice uh, dense mat. We, it's a, it's a uh, long lived, it's, it's slow growing. It spreads out slowly but surely. And we, we prune it only on the edges. Uh, it has a, a long uh, blooming season. So all the plants, or m many of the plants that we have here in the yard are, uh, attract insects. Uh, so we've enjoyed the many, many insect species, butterflies, bees. So the next plant we want to show you is the coastal sagewort. And you can see on this spike here, their flowers are poking out. Uh, they're small flowers, uh, which make it difficult to see the flower, but the feature of this plant is its uh, is its color and structure? These these spikes are just dramatic, and they add a great aesthetic to the yard. Behind the sagewort, we have Chamiso's lupin. Uh, you can see this plant's about five feet tall. It's probably maybe four years old. Uh, it'll live maybe one or two more years and then it'll die back, become a skeleton, but it spreads its seed around the yard and, and they pop up frequently uh, and it grows very easily uh, here. So uh, this, is a, this is our manzanita. This is the oldest plant in the garden. Uh, so right here is, is where we broke through the concrete patio and, and established the first few plants. The manzanita provides good perching you can see in there, good perching for uh, for songbirds. And right now it's putting on new growth. It blooms in January and February. And we do prune this back in the fall. Uh, one of the few plants that we actually prune back pretty heartily. Uh, I want to show you across the way here. This fence is on the south uh, property line. And uh, the, the, the fence casts a shadow in, in, the, uh, in the winter. So it's in full shade during the winter. So good spot for California polypod. Uh, you can see it's starting to fade now. And it'll be all dried out by summertime. It'll, it'll fade away. But after the first rains in the winter, the little polypods, little fiddle necks of polypod, 
poke up through the ground and we get to enjoy the, them all winter long. Oh, okay, let's, let's go back across the trail. Look at that, coast buckwheat. Mike Belcher mentioned this plant as, an, as a host plant for the green hair street butterfly, which we hope to get someday back here. That would be exciting. Uh, this is, the buckwheat's the predominant plant in our yard. It's probably what we have most of. And you can see this one's starting to bloom. Nice. Behind nice. that, we have blue blossom, Ceanothus thrisiflora. That's, and it the, loves uh, the full, that's the San Francisco native one, right? Uh, yeah, it is. And it, it loves the full sun exposure. Uh, this is a south facing. There's another one that grows back in this dense cluster of vegetation, but it, it's, it's really tiny and it, it doesn't get much sun. So, but it's back there. And someday when that, uh, when that lupin dies back, the Ceanothus will, will flourish up again. Getting back to the other side here, we have Aster chilensis. Uh, this is the shady side, once again, the shady side of the yard, but it also grows well on the sunny side. And we'll show you some at the very end of our little tour, growing in, the, in full sunlight. So it's a very adaptable plant. Foreground here, this is uh, Armeria meridima, uh, sea pink. Uh, attracts it's these blossoms are beautiful little little pom-poms they're pink and the butterflies like it insects like it as a nectar source as you mentioned we have four bird baths there's one of them and I want to show you the base of the bird bath is Dudleya We've tried this throughout the yard at different locations and it seems to really like this spot the best. It, the last few years it's been spreading out here and, and it sends up flower stalks every single year. Behind that bird bath you can see a really nice buckwheat plant. That's the shape that they take when they're, when they're unimpeded and uh, there's no other plants around to challenge them. They spread out into a round circular mound like that very dense foliage, and that's just starting to put some flower stalks up. And I'm gonna let Joanne tell you about the back corner over here. This is one of our least, um, one of the last frontiers, so to speak, and it's a little bit wild. We also have a plant here that requires a lot of supplemental watering. It's our sticky monkey flower, and we've tried it throughout the yard, and this one has continued to bloom every year with the supplemental watering and in the background you can also see we've got beech strawberry and it's sent up lots of blooms and there's lots of flower buds along here and interspersed is also some miner's lettuce which is one of the plants we did not plant back here and it has self-sowed and spread throughout and it was a very lovely surprise once we started clearing all the non-natives back here that that yeah. popped up yeah that was in the seed stock that was just back here. So it's a, it's a volunteer. And it's it's a, the only original plant in the yard. And down here we also have a, a blackberry, California blackberry, that it kind of came along also with one of the plants we had purchased at the CNPS plant sale. And so we decided to go ahead and plant it with must reservation because reservation, um, it does spread. And then I'm going to let Matt take over. Okay, so coming along I'll just back away so I can reorient you where we are. We're, we're at the back fence uh, and down at the base here we have California Facelia. It's another favorite of ours. It, it does very well. Beautiful purple inflorescence that unfurl themselves. And you can probably see some, do we have some bumblebees? Uh, yeah, here's some right in front of the right in front of me. You can see how the bumblebees love this plant. And you know, speaking of bumblebees, right next to it we have bee plant. And those There's, are big, uh, those yellow face. Those big. are yellow face bumblebees. Bombus Vosnaseski, named after a Russian guy. Uh, bee plant puts out tiny 
little flowers. This is Scrofularia. Uh, even though the flowers aren't showy, the plant is is really uh, quite beautiful. It very grows in in uh, tall spikes, and it does very well. Spreads around. I think we only planted probably only a couple plants, and it's really taken off in this whole section of the yard. Nice. Uh, here we have a toyon, the only toyon we have in the yard, and it's about probably about 10 years old. Let me back up a little so you can see it better. Uh, so we do prune this also. We, we, we want to keep it uh, contained so it doesn't get too big. And you can see it's full of buds right now. There's, it blooms every year, but for some reason, the, uh, the berries never ripen on this one. Uh, and we're not sure why. We're trying to find that out. Wow. Somebody Maybe knows. not enough sun. I don't know. No, because they... Maybe. They... Uh, we get a lot of fog in the summer, so it might be, it might be a function of just uh, not enough sun in the summertime. How old is it? It's got to be 10 years old oh, at least. it's probably more than that. 12 oh, years old. Well, ours, ours in Potrero Hill has abundant fruit. So huh. I'm not, not sure. So, hey, a couple of questions uh, from the audience here. Susan asked, what species of manzanita do you have? Okay, that's uh, the common manzanita. It's called manzanita uh, or Arctostephalus manzanita. And oh, it was okay. Keyed out by, uh, it was keyed out to that species by an expert. Uh, we, okay. we didn't know what it was. We thought it might have been uh, the San Francisco manzanita it's originally. So Okay. Now here we have, and, and is, did that answer your question sufficiently, Eddie? Yes. Well, I think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is mock heather, and you can see it's beautiful color, beautiful texture. Uh, it it is medium lived. It lives a few years, and it'll die back. Uh, it blooms in the fall, and it puts out little yellow flowers. The flowers aren't aren't big and showy by themselves, but collectively they are. And this plant will turn from green to gold in the fall. Uh, it's, it's a very nice shrub. Let's see, behind that, underneath the toyon, you can see way down in there, those leaves, small leaves that are arrowhead shaped. I don't know if you can see them. Maybe, but that is the coast morning glory. And there we can see some blossoms, large flower, very showy. Uh, we planted this one in several spots in the yard as well, and and it seems to like this area underneath the toy on. Uh, in nice. the other spots we planted it, it kind of faded out. So a lot of the our plantings are trial and error. There's micro or micro habitats throughout the yard. Uh, and so Joanne and I are not the only gardeners here. We have another gardener that helps us out. That's oh. California scrub jay. <laughs> here you can see a little coast live oak that the jays have planted for the last few years now. They've been planting acorns in our yard every every year. And so these oaks sprout up here and there, and, and sometimes we have to pull them out. They're not in the not in a good spot. But this one you decide to leave for a while. This is coyote bush, baccarus. Oh, there's a, let me try to get on that. See that ladybug? And that's old man root or cucumber that has died back. Yeah, wild cucumber. Season. You can see the skeleton of the wild cucumber there. Uh, coyote bush blooms in the fall. Uh, behind that, that's some seaside daisy. This is a, a plant that puts out nice showy flowers, but it, it doesn't seem to really thrive in our yard. It, it'll grow here and it blooms, but it uh, seems like it struggles a little bit. We're not, just haven't hit the right microclimate for it. Maybe try it in a different spot in the yard. We're now on the back. I'm going to back up a little bit to show you where we are. This is the north fence, so 
this gets full sun and gets pretty dry here. So we don't, we don't water this, uh, we don't directly water any of this. This is all on its own. Uh, in the summer, when it's heavy fog, I do come out here and supplement. So I spray it with water to, to uh, mimic like fog mist. Uh, and whether that helps or not, I'm not sure. And we do have to weed throughout the year, mostly after the winter rains and the spring. Yeah, we do. Uh, I think the maintenance on this yard takes about an hour a week of one to two hours a week, I'd say. I want to show you something here that I think is interesting. Uh, if I zoom way down, you can see lots of uh, Mike. Mike Belcher, you're still with us. We got babies here too. These are seedlings. That's uh, buckwheat. And there's a little coast live oak. And on the path here, let's see. Oh, there's a honeybee. <laughs> There's, that's this coastal sage, the little seedling of coastal sage. And, and uh, you can see it's right on our footpath here. They do get trampled, but some of them we can, we can uh, take from here and transplant to other parts of the yard where they're more, where we need to infill. I'll bet you guys have lots of uh, beautiful aromas on warm still days. Yes, yes. it smells like, like a, you know, a wild chaparral area. And here we have, uh, this and is the only plant. Have any green hair streaks? Not haven't sure. gotten one yet, huh. but well, I, we're looking. We're hoping. You got hope I can get a picture of it. A lot of beautiful buckwheat there. Yes, yes. yes. Like I said, the, the buckwheat's the predominant plant we have here. But behind that buckwheat, you can see uh, the silvery uh, foliage. That's California fuchsia. And I think it's the only plant that, the only native plant that is somewhat aggressive. We do have to knock it back. It'll spread and dominate the other plants that are near it. Yet it puts out the most beautiful tubular red flowers in the fall when most of the other plants have stopped blooming besides the mock heather. Um, we have nice tubular flowers that are a feast for our eyes and a feast for the hummingbirds, but we also have a couple yeah, of beehives, the honeybees, you're in the bee line. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting bombarded by some bees <laughs> here now, but uh -oh. <laughs> uh, just to back, just to, so we're kind of back where we started at, at our starting point once again, you can see, so we just did a little loop around the yard. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so that's... So there's a, uh, there's a good question about gophers. In fact, we get this question a lot. Do you have your own uh, personal barn owl or uh, do you, do you uh, get gophers in your yard? Well, we've, we've don't have, never detected a barn owl yet. We've, we've heard uh, great horned owls back here. And there's a couple, let me just, I'm gonna tip up and show you. There's a couple tall trees in the neighbors. There's a, if you can see, there's a cypress that's pretty tall. And uh, I'm not sure what species that is. And then on the other side, the other neighbor has a redwood. There's a stunt, kind of a stunted redwood there. So uh, we do get great horned owls occasionally. Uh, we've had gophers in the yard uh, just a few times. That it really. Took our Hoopin Chimosa, the first one. It was just about this tall, and it just pulled it straight down. Yeah, we we did lose a few uh, plants early on to gophers, but uh, it seems that, uh, and you know, I've thought about it. I worry about it a little bit, and if a couple of gophers get back here, they can cause some damage. But it seems like it's dense enough that, and it gets dry enough in the summer. In the summer. The, the sand, you saw this, you saw how it's really sandy. Let me go back over here. In the summer, it really dries out. You can, right now, if I were to dig down in that sand, just a few inches, it's, it's moist. But as the, the year progresses into the summer, you could dig down quite a ways and it's dry as a bone. So uh, I think that deters the gophers. Uh, they can't, 
maintain a tunnel, it, it, it caves in on them. Uh, so that's probably what what keeps the gophers out of here. Thanks so much. That was that was a really wonderful tour and uh, fantastic garden. Let me flip it back around. Here. It's amazing what sand can do. Yeah. So it was. We enjoyed doing this and. Uh, Let's get, uh, get a better view. There you go. The sun is shining now. The sun's finally coming out. Yeah, yeah. So, thanks well, so much, was, everybody. Thank you. That was happy really gardening. lovely. Yeah, and happy Mother's Day to everybody again. And hey, um, we'll uh, we'll catch up with you all real soon. I hope. Yeah, Joanne.